for the recording. So once again, I would like to thank all of you on behalf of the Columbus Karma Takes Some Trolling for joining us today for this Amitabha program, uh, Heaven in Our Mind. Uh, as I mentioned in before we started the recording, uh, Kempo Kartha Rinpoche, the founder of the Columbus KTC, gave us the practices of Chen Rezi, the Bodhisattva of Compassion, and Amitabha, the Buddha of Boundless Light, as our, I guess you could say, our beginner practices. Yes, we learned quiet sitting meditation, and yes, we learned compassion meditation, which are two parts of the three parts of practice in Tibetan Buddhism. So, um, as, so as a result, we learned what we could about this, and uh, and so everything that. But he really told us that the mantra practices were going to help us a lot. And if you look at the word mantra, the word mantra has several meanings. And one of the meanings of the word mantra is a protection for the mind. And, uh, and, so, and so by doing the practice, we are protecting our mind. But what are we protecting our mind from? We're protecting our mind from our confused, <laughs> our confused thinking. And so the, the practice of Amitabha, where we chant uh, the description of Amitabha, we chant the description of his pure realm, we chant the mantra, Om Ami Dewa Hri. As we make, as we chant and describe this place that is uh, pure and beautiful, we, for just a few moments, mentally place ourselves in the presence of an enlightened being. Yes, it's in our imaginations, but as you will see through the, through the first part of the lecture I'm going to give today, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit at the beginning about the theory of mantra meditation, why we do it, and the theory about the pure realm and what it is, and the theory about the Buddha Amitabha. So I'm going to give a little bit of an introduction to all of that. And, uh, and, but meanwhile, the Buddha Amitabha, by placing ourselves in his presence and requesting his blessing for a short period of time, our little meditation room can become a pure realm. And, uh, and so for that short period of time, our own environment can become a pure realm, in our, in, at least in our mind. And that's why I titled the program heaven in our mind, because we use our mind to meditate. And by using our mind to meditate, we create within our mind the environment of awakening. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a few minutes. But in some ways, the, the real uh, heavenly realm, the real Dewa Chen or pure realm of the Buddha Amitabha, the real Dewa Chen is the enlightened state of mind, which we all possess the potential to accomplish. And since we all possess the potential to accomplish awakened mind, methods like the mantra of the Buddha Amitabha and the Buddha Chen uh, and the Bodhisattva Chen Rezi, these methods resonate with us and help us to uncover and hopefully realize our, our most inner Buddha nature. So that's a little bit by way of introduction uh, for what we're going to do today. Uh, by the way, uh, I have to take one moment because I did find a lost child. There is a person who is texting me saying, I don't have the Zoom link. Um, I'm going to ask uh, uh, Tanya for a moment. Could you um, could you um, uh, please put it in chat the the Zoom link in the chat? I'll copy it and send it over to our lost person. Okay, if you don't mind, thank you. Yeah, uh, this does this does tend to happen um, uh, when we have uh, people who sign up uh, in the very very last moments of the program. Thank you. I'm going to send that over to her now. Yeah, this is one of the um, one of the disadvantages uh, to the um, Eventbrite system uh, is that people who um, 
uh, who sign up at the very, very last minute sometimes miss out on the uh, on the links, even though we put it in the registration. Sometimes they miss them. Okay, thank you. All right. So um, I'm going to, uh, the, the layout for our program today is that I'm going to start with about 15 uh, minutes of a presentation, and then uh, I'll stop and pause for questions. In the meantime, while I'm speaking, if you have a question that develops, um, there is a chat function here and you can press the chat function and then type your question into chat. Make sure that you are uh, addressing everyone in the group because um, otherwise we may not see your question. And so I won't uh, stop uh, my presentation in the middle to handle questions. Uh, so um, we'll be muting folks uh, until the question period. Um, but uh, that's how uh, that's how I like to uh, to arrange it. A little bit of talk, a little bit of question, and then a little bit of talk and a little bit of question. Plus, uh, at the top of the hour, we will be taking a five uh, to seven minute break uh, so that folks can get up and move around and and uh, get a glass of water, whatever. And uh, and then uh, we'll be back uh, seven minutes uh, after the the break begins. Uh, the recording that we're making today is uh, going to be posted on uh, the YouTube site. So uh, anyone who uh, would rather their image not appear uh, can uh, go up to the little, uh, the little corner where you have the little box with the three dots in your Zoom window and click stop video. Okay, so I think we covered those things. And I, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't do that earlier. <laughs> I just, I'm so excited to see everyone. What can I tell you? Because um, this is a teaching from the Buddhist tradition, I'm going to start with a short prayer. I'm going to recite um, the, uh, the short prayer of taking refuge and then uh, a short prayer to uh, my teacher asking for his presence. These are prayers you can join in if you wish. Uh, and, if, um, and if these prayers are unfamiliar to you, you can join in in your heart and in your mind uh, thinking that you dedicate this session to all suffering beings. I'm going to recite the refuge in Bodhicitta uh, three times, twice in English and once in Tibetan. Until I reach enlightenment, I take refuge in the Buddha, Dharma, and the Noble Sangha. Through the merit of accomplishing the six perfections, may we achieve awakening for the benefit of sentient beings. Until we reach enlightenment, we take refuge in the Buddha, Dharma, and the Noble Sangha. Through the merit of accomplishing the six perfections, may we achieve awakening for the benefit of all sentient beings. Drola Penchir Sanjay Druparsho. And now I see, um, let's see. Uh, okay, sorry, I, I got distracted by something. Sorry about that. Now I'm going to recite a short prayer uh, for the uh, blessing of the teachers of our lineage. Oh, Paldin Sawilama Rimboche. Dagi chi war pe de denchula, Kadrin jembo gane je sante, Kusun tugging a drup sal Okay, thank you. This morning, as I was uh, preparing my opening remarks for today, um, it occurred to me that it would be good to talk about. Uh, the practice of Amitabha from the point of view of the entirety of Buddhism, rather than saying, hi, I'm going to teach Amitabha. Here's what we do on page one. <laughs> Instead, I'm going to give a short talk on the place of this particular practice in the scheme of Buddhism. So um, when the Buddha experienced his uh, spiritual awakening, 2,600 years ago. And when he began teaching, one of his central messages was that all 
other beings had the potential to achieve the spiritual awakening or Buddhahood that he himself achieved. So he was saying from the very beginning that he was not unique, that there were other enlightened beings and that all of us have the potential to be enlightened beings also. It's not just that there was one Buddha and there will never be another. It's that all of us possess Buddha nature, which means we have a mind that has the potential to awaken to its own nature and experience Buddhahood ourselves. So that was one of the Buddha's central messages was that others could replicate his accomplishment. And there, and he also taught that there was a path, a path that could make that accomplishment possible. Yeah, the Eightfold Noble Path of uh, right intention, action, speech, livelihood, meditation, and so on. This Eightfold Noble Path boiled down, if we boil it down from the eightfold, practices of awareness, ethics, meditation, and wisdom. If we boil all of those themes from the uh, Eightfold Noble Path down to the four statements, they're summarized by the Buddha in the sutras when he said, do no harm whatsoever, practice virtue as much as you can, and tame your mind. This is the teaching of the Buddha. Now, since that last statement is a summary, that leaves us with three points that are key points to the Buddha's teaching. Do no harm whatsoever, practice virtue as much as you can, and tame your mind. So, uh, so this is what we have to practice. We have to practice doing our best not to harm ourselves, doing our best not to harm others, doing our best to take care of ourselves, and doing our best to benefit others. This really is the, the meaning of virtue, is to take care of self and benefit others. And so in order to do that, we have to practice the taming of the mind. Because how, if we don't have the taming of our mind, if we don't tame our own mind, how will we even know if what we are doing is harmful? How will we even know if what we are doing is helpful? and so on. So we have to practice meditation, which is mindfulness and awareness. We have to practice mindfulness and awareness or mindfulness meditation or meditation in order to know what's going on in our minds. Because when we first sit down to practice meditation and do the, even if we do the simplest meditation practice that the Buddha taught, which was to be aware of the breathing as it comes and goes. And when our thoughts wander or when our attention wanders away from the breath as our object, we gently bring it back and start fresh. This practice of placing attention on the breath and noticing and being able to return our attention when, uh, when we wander, this just this basic practice of of training our attention helps us to know the thoughts that are on our mind. And when we know the thoughts that are on our mind, we have a better chance of consciously choosing to not do harm and consciously choosing to perform benefit. So this is why meditation is a central practice for all Buddhists. So the Buddha gave us the basic information of knowing that we have the potential to become Buddhists. And he also gave us the Eightfold Noble Path in order to accomplish that. But he also let us know that we were not alone on our journey. We didn't have to make it up as we went along. We didn't have to do it all by ourselves. We have company, we have friends. And those of you who are familiar with basic Buddhism know that when a person begins their Buddhist practice, they begin it as we began this session, by taking refuge in the Buddha as our teacher, the Dharma as our path, and the Sangha as our community. So we're not alone in our attempts to purify our negativities and to ripen our inner Buddha qualities. The Buddha we can rely on because the Buddha has attained awakening. And the Buddha in his teachings said that the mind of every individual was never created in the first place, and in that way has always existed from the no beginning of time 
and always will exist until the no ending of time. So this being that we are, which did not have a beginning and will not have an end, nevertheless goes through a series of experiences. Some people call it rebirth. Some people call it reincarnation. Uh, my teacher told me rebirth was a little bit more accurate. That this stream of being that we are, which the Buddha actually did compare to a river, just as, just as you can't put your foot in the same river twice. That's, that's a Western saying. The Buddha said that our stream of being goes through time and is constantly moving and changing. And there, this is why we can make changes in our thoughts. This is why we can make changes in our speech and why we can make changes in our activities. And so the Buddha said, if we wanted to train to be like him, that we would do no harm, practice virtue, and tame the mind. But he also said we would have company along the journey, the Buddha as our teacher, the Dharma as our path, and the Sangha as our community. Furthermore, in the Tantras, three roots of refuge were described. The, uh, the Lamas, uh, which are the root of, of all blessing, and that they give us the teachings that help us to uncover our Buddha nature. The um, the, the yidam deities, the word yidam means um, a bond of the mind. And, and uh, I tell people that because I grew up Catholic, the closest thing that I could describe to a yidam is patron saint. Those of you who grew up Catholic, remember your patron saint. I remember mine. And we pray to that particular saint to be our guide and accompany us on our journey of spirituality and Catholicism. And in Buddhism, we take specific Buddhas or Bodhisattvas to be our patron Buddha or our uh, Yidam deity. And by we take them as our root of accomplishment because it's through practicing their mantra, through practicing visualization of their being and their pure realm that we come to uncover our own Buddha nature. That's a whole topic in itself, but we'll have to do that one on another day. But we take refuge also in the lamas as the root of all blessing, the yidams as the root of all accomplishment, and the dharma protectors, which are special uh, bodhisattvas who have the action of fierceness. They, they, uh, they are like our bodyguards on the path, and uh, they frequently look pretty fierce, and some of them are armed. Those of you who are familiar with Catholic imagery will remember the images of the archangel Michael, who is often depicted, as he has been since medieval times, as bearing a shield and carrying a sword in his, in his uh, quest against evil. Well, the, uh, the Buddhists have those two. We call them protectors, and they're bodhisattvas who, through their fierceness and strength, remind us of our own inner strength to say no to our own negative action. They protect us in a way, their blessing protects us from ourself and our own bad actions. So the Buddha talked to us about these six sources of refuge, the three jewels and the three roots, and said that we could rely upon them as we were walking our journey of awakening. And by telling us that there were others who had uh, treaded uh, or trod this path ahead of us that get and he said that by understanding and knowing that there were others that had who had gone ahead of us we could look to their example and use their example to help ourselves to become inspired and encouraged along the path and in fact in the tibetan tradition there's a there's a tradition called nam tar that's spelled n a m t h a r Namtar. And the Namtar means full liberation or complete ripening or complete liberation. And it refers to the life stories of the great masters. By reading these Namtar or complete liberation stories, we hopefully will feel inspired that even in our own ordinary state right now, we could become extraordinary by practicing and studying as the Buddhists of the past have done. So the Buddha said, not only uh, are there uh, these, all of these enlightened beings that from among these, all of these enlightened beings, he described the activity of five Buddhas in particular. 
And you'll remember this from the, uh, the teachings, uh, which you can see on the Columbus KTC YouTube channel. We've had two lectures in the last two months about the five Buddha families. And uh, Marcus Casey gave one and Lama Adam gave one. And so you can go and refer to those for more teachings on this. But in, in the sutras, the Buddha explained the activities of the, um, of the five Buddhas and their uh, pure realms. And he also described them in a symbol as being symbolic. So for example, these five Buddhas, each one exemplifies a different type of wisdom that arises when, when our confusion and mental afflictions are overthrown. So through the process of doing no harm, practicing virtue and taming your mind, we purify our mind of negativity and we ripen our interior qualities. And so what the Buddha said about the five Buddha families is that each one of these symbolizes the overcoming of a different mental affliction. One symbolizes the overcoming of ignorance, another attachment, another anger, another jealousy, and yet another pride. So these, um, these five Buddhas then symbolize our overcoming of our own negativity. And through the teaching, through the ages, uh, teachers who have read the sutras have uh, concluded that each one of these five Buddhas has a function and that we actually possess the blessing of these five Buddhas within us. But we also have these five negative mental afflictions within us too. So our practice is aimed at reducing the mental afflictions and turning them into wisdom. So that's, the, that's our work as Buddhists. So um, as the Buddha described them in the sutras, each one of these five Buddhas has specific qualities and could benefit us in specific ways. I'm going to just give you three examples of the five. The Buddha Akshobhya, who is sometimes called the, uh, the immovable or unmoving, he represents the strength that comes from abandoning the negative mental affliction of anger. So his wisdom exemplifies the strength that comes from the abandonment of anger. The Buddha Ratna Sambhava, he symbolizes the power and strength of equanimity that comes from abandoning pride and greed. And the Buddha Amitabha, who is our topic today, symbolizes the stability and discernment that comes from abandoning compulsive attachment. So the Buddha said that, um, our, that even though we are very fortunate to have the life that we have now, we have a basic problem. And the basic problem we have in life is that we don't recognize and don't realize that we have the potential to become Buddhas. We tend to think of ourselves as ordinary beings and we tend to think of the world we live in as an ordinary world. And so this error that we have made in which we think we are ordinary and the world is ordinary causes us to project the idea that everything in our world is real, solid, permanent, and unchanging. And so by making this assumption, the Buddha said, we make a mistake. And the mistake comes from the fact that this world is actually not permanent, not solid, not real, and not unchanging. And in fact, the Buddha said that this entire world that we are living in, including our bodies, are interdependent, interdependent, and impermanent. So in a way, you could say that the Buddha is trying to bring us back to sanity because it's a little bit insane to look at a world that is impermanent and try to insist that that world become permanent. So if we're acting toward our world and the people in it as though everything is permanent and everything should never change, then we're actually uh, we're acting and thinking and speaking uh, against the reality of the situation. 
So what we have to do then in the practice of Buddhism is do no harm, practice virtue and tame your mind as a means of calming the mind down so that it can begin to see the impermanence of thought, the impermanence of sensation and experience and perception and the interdependence of everything. We're very fortunate in some ways to live in a live in a world in which physics and chemistry and biology are well studied by many because even physicists are beginning to talk about things in ways that make them sound a little close to Buddhist teaching, that everything is impermanent. Uh, what is it? Second law of thermodynamics is everything falls apart. So, I mean, from, from the point of view of science, the Buddhist, the Buddhist idea that everything is impermanent and everything is in complete, is co in continuous change, it's actually kind of true, even by uh, the uh, uh, demonstrable uh, scientific method. So the Buddha said, we make this basic mistake. We try to project a world that's permanent and unchanging when it's actually impermanent, interdependent, and always on the move. So what do we do? How do we fix this? Well, uh, we first begin to, we have to start by recognizing that we've made the mistake. We have to see that we grasp at things because we think they're permanent and we actually grasp at things because we think that they will bring us happiness. Because external happiness and material happiness is all we understand right now in, in, sort, of the, in sort of the infancy of our thinking and the infancy of our spirit, we, we uh, have fallen under this way of this basic ignorance and the other mental afflictions that come from basic ignorance, which is attaching to things, thinking we need them and disliking or being averse to things, thinking we have to get away from them. So because of this, it's almost as though we're going back and forth and back and forth uh, again, uh, with all of this confusion. And in fact, it's even more than that. If you've ever heard the Buddhist term samsara, it means cyclic existence, where we are always trying to get what we want and failing or getting what we want and then losing it because of impermanence. And so those of you who are familiar with the Buddhist iconography, you may have seen something called the wheel of life. And this wheel of life is a description of our confused existence in samsara. But the interesting image to me is the center of that wheel. It, there are three animals that symbolize the ignorance, attachment, and aversion that the Buddha said were at the center of all of our confusion. And they're depicted in iconography as animals that are biting each other's tails in, in an endless loop. The, uh, even though we know that pigs are very intelligent, in the old days, they thought of them as a symbol for ignorance because they probably, because they would eat indiscriminately anything, including garbage. So there's, there's the pig. There is also a snake symbolizing aggression, which you can see by the, them, them using a snake as an example because of the aggressive nature of the snake's attack. And then finally, the rooster who is always looking after his flock and being attached to all of his flock symbolize the attachment. So these three mental poisons are, you could call them the engine of samsara and th that fuels and continues to confuse us. So in order to stop this illusory experience of samsara, the Buddhist teaching literally tells us just to stop. It tells us to stop. Because if you look at the practice of uh, the of the three teachings that the Buddha gave, do no harm. That means stop harming beings. Do as much uh, do as much virtue as possible. Stop being selfish. And then finally tame your mind is take a break from conceptuality. <laughs> take a break and let your thoughts go. And if you take a break and let your thoughts go, this actually 
produces an interruption in what appears to us to be a continuous flow of illusion. And so literally we're asked to stop by doing no harm, practicing virtue and taming the mind. So that's, uh, these are the methods that the Buddha taught. And uh, meditation in particular, quiet sitting meditation gradually helps us to stop grasping by slowing down that machinery of confusion of our thoughts. And it allows us to see that there is a better way to live. And, uh, and then next, we can learn that everybody, for example, one of the things we can learn is that everybody's going through this same illusion. Everybody's stuck here in some sorrow with us. And that instead of competing with them, we should maybe start cooperating so that we can survive some sorrow together. I mean, it's not like a big, it's not like a big episode of Survivor, but and I don't think the gamesmanship really works very well there. But the idea is that we need to rely on each other in this world to help us go beyond this world. So we need to cooperate and not compete. Um, and so it all of these teachings, whether it's the teaching of quiet sitting meditation, compassion meditation, mantra meditation, all of them are aimed at quieting the chatter and showing us a different way to live. Quiet sitting shows us there are gaps between our thoughts, which means we can actually change our thoughts. You know that thought we let go of in meditation? Where does it go? It just disappears. And because it disappears, this means it was never really much to begin with. And putting a lot of stock in it doesn't really make sense. So that helps us to relax our minds a little more. When we practice sending out love on the out breath and practicing compassion on the in breath, is, which is what we do in compassion meditation, which is also called Tonglen. And so Tonglen meditation teaches us further to let go of selfishness in situations by training us in love. And then finally, mantra practice allows us to, for a moment, acknowledge we have Buddha nature, imagine that Buddha nature in the form of a Buddha or Bodhisattva, for a moment, create a pure realm around ourselves and experience the body, speech, and mind of a Buddha, what it must be like to be a Buddha. And this is, a, this is actually a very powerful thing. And if we do it enough, then we will actually begin to transform the way we see the world. The, you'll, you may have heard of or seen images in Buddhist teaching you may have seen images called mandalas. And mandala, the word in Sanskrit, and it's kilkor in Tibetan, literally means center and surrounding. Center and surrounding. That's what the word mandala means. And often we depict these mandalas in sand or in painting. And we think of them as being two dimensional. Uh, representations of a pure realm where everything is beautiful. There's a beautiful palace and inside the beautiful palace are Buddhas and Bodhisattvas and including us. Uh, the Buddha or Bodhisattva that we imagine ourselves to be is the center of that pure realm that's depicted in the mandala. We are the center and our retinue, our pure realm and so forth is our surrounding. So when we imagine that we transform ourselves into a Buddha and our surrounding into a pure realm, it's a very interesting exercise because I don't know if anybody's already told you this, but you currently do have a mandala. It's just a little confused. You think about all of your people, you know, your people, your family, your friends, your coworkers, your employees. You think of all of these people as your people. And you think of the house that you live in and all of the community that surrounds it, it's kind of like your place. And so when Kempo Karthar Rinpoche taught us about the practice of mantra, he said, the center and surrounding that you experience right now is being experienced in confusion, 
and the idea of projecting solidity on everything and all of this. He said, so he said, when you practice the pure realm of a Buddha or Bodhisattva, you are practicing what your now confused mandala could actually become and really actually already is. You just have to start seeing it differently. So this practice that we're talking about today, the practice of the Buddha Amitabha is a practice of transformation. By momentarily transforming the, our world into a pure realm, uh, we practice enlightenment. We practice the love, compassion, and wisdom of a bodhisattva in real time. Now, um, you might ask, well, what is, uh, why is the Buddha Amitabha called the, the Buddha of boundless light? And why is his pure realm called Dewa Chen in Tibetan or Sukhavati in Sanskrit? Whether you call it Sukhavati or Dewa Chen, Sukhavati, Dewa Chen, whatever you call it, it means the blissful, the happy realm. And, um, and so, uh, he's called the Buddha of boundless light because he's associated with the direction of the West and the sunset and the, and the uh, ending of the day. So this boundless light that spreads out everywhere, that's his, uh, I guess you could say that's his manifestation. And, uh, and the pure realm of Dewa Chen, it was written about in the Amitabha Sutras. In the Amitabha Sutras, the, the Buddha gave the teaching that when the, uh, when the, before the Buddha Amitabha became the Buddha Amitabha, when he himself was an aspiring bodhisattva, he made the aspiration that through his enlightened wisdom, he would manifest, when he became a Buddha, he would manifest a pure realm that all sentient beings could enter. And that this would be his gift to the world, would be this pure realm of Dewa Chen. And so as a result, he became known as the Buddha of Dewa Chen or the Buddha of the Western paradise or the pure realm. And it was based on his promise that he made when he was an aspiring bodhisattva. This is something that you learn about in, uh, in general Buddhist teaching. Uh, where uh, when you uh, first generate the mind of enlightenment saying, I want to become a Buddha, when you say it for the first time, you can also make other aspirations that when I attain enlightenment, I will help beings in this way, or I will help them in this way, or I will help them in this way. If we don't do that, when we first uh, generate uh, awakening, the awakening mind, it's okay. I think you have plenty of opportunities to do that again and again in your everyday life. But because of the Buddha Amitabha's aspiration, when he actually became a Buddha, he manifested this pure realm. Now, a lot of people say, well, that kind of sounds weird to me. How is it possible that a Buddha can manifest a pure realm uh, that, that anybody can enter? And you know, um, for a long time, I wondered about this too, but then I had this thought, you know, if human beings, as confused as we are, if human beings can create environments, whether it's a beautiful national park, whether it's a beautiful architectural building, whether it's uh, the, the example I used to use was a casino in Las Vegas. When you walk into a casino in Las Vegas, they're trying to completely envelop you there are nice smells. There are beautiful people. There are incredible flowers, fountains, and you name it inside this casino. They, they don't want you to leave. They want you to feel like you're in heaven. And so if confused ordinary beings can create little heavens on earth, now who are we to say to the Buddha Amitabha, we're sorry, you can't do that. <laughs> so I am willing to, uh, to offer the benefit of the doubt to the Buddha Amitabha that he might have a little bit of, cap of capacity to create a pure realm that anyone can enter. So um, that's a little bit about, um, about the pure realm. 
Now I have to tell a story because I see Gloria is with us and, um, and, and uh, Gloria and I see and Girme also is with us. Uh, and uh, you're part of the, uh, of the Sangha uh, in Hartford. Uh, there are a couple of different Buddhist Sanghas in Hartford. And I know uh, that the, I was present with one of the Sanghas when Kempo Sultram Jamso uh, came to visit a number of years ago when he was still teaching incredibly wise scholar and meditation master. Uh, he's the kind of person who, if you asked him a question, you could count on the answer. The answer would always be incredible and wise. Well, someone said, someone asked him, well, you know, Rinpoche, in the Amitabha Sutras, it says that the pure realm looks like a park. It's got soft grass and swaying trees in the breeze and there are birds and, and like there are jewels and beauty everywhere. And like, it says this in the sutras and he said, and then the person said to, uh, Rim, to um, Kempo Soldier Rinpoche, is that true? And Kempo Soldier Rinpoche said, of course not. <laughs> he said, of course not. He said, the Dewa Chen or Sukhavati is actually beyond the human imagination. It's beyond our ability to even conceive of it. It's, it is the state of Buddhahood itself. It is the state of Buddhahood itself. But for the benefit of sentient beings, so that they would understand the importance of this place, of course, it's described as being heaven. Of course, it's being described in that way. And so it was a skillful means on the part of the Buddha to encourage everyone to be reborn in Dewa Chen. So even ordinary people can be reborn in Dewa Chen. So I love that answer and that answer meant a lot to me. And so I do repeat it every time that I teach on Amitabha because it just blew my mind that he was just, he just said, of course not. It's the state of enlightenment and you can't describe what the state of enlightenment is. But for the purposes of, of, in, of beings, you, you do this. And when you think about this, Campbell Carthur Rinpoche himself explained when he was encouraging all of us to practice the Buddha Amitabha, and for all of us to make the aspiration to be reborn in the pure realm of the Buddha Amitabha. He said, please, all of you, he says, I'm making the aspiration to be reborn in Dewa Chen, so you should too. And so we, we all said, yes, Rinpoche, we'll, we'll, we'll be there with you. And he said that part of the reason that this is important, he said, is that if at the time of death, you are focused on the intention to be reborn in Amitabha's pure realm, he said, you will not experience the bardo. I want to repeat that. If you are focused at the time of your death on rebirth in Dewa Chen, you will not experience the bardo. He said, you will experience instantaneous rebirth in the pure realm of the Buddha Amitabha. He said, it's a bypass. You're basically bypassing the bardo and taking rebirth in the pure realm. And so in other words, and he told uh, one of my friends, Bradley, uh, who was dying of cancer at the time, he said, don't worry about not having become a Buddha in this lifetime. Don't worry. He said, when you arise in Dewa Chen, you will see the Buddha Amitabha and instantly you will attain awakening on the spot. So uh, he said, you'll attain the first level of Bodhisattva awakening on the spot. And then he said, after that, he says, you're going to have to work a little bit and to traverse the rest of the Bodhisattva levels. But of course, naturally, you'll be in Dewa Chen. So it'll be much easier. <laughs> so that's a little bit of a teaching about why we do mantra practice, about who the Buddha Amitabha is, was, and will be, uh, about the pure realm how it is the state of awakening, and yet it's also heaven arising in our minds, and, uh, and that we can make the aspiration to be reborn there. Uh, so I talked a long time, sorry, uh, but I will take a look at chat now to see if there are any questions uh, that people might have. And, um, and I think Tanya will be also uh, en enabling unmuting in case people would like to ask a question um, uh, on audio. 
Anybody have a question? I'm keeping an eye out here in case anybody has their hand up. You don't have to put your hand up if you, yeah, okay, Kim, Kim. Kim in Canada, can you unmute? No, not yet, it's not working. That's, there she is. You got it, Kim. Oh, okay, great. Okay, so here's a weird question. So um, I'm listening to um, your description that Daywatchen is the um, state of enlightenment itself. Mm -hmm. and if we aspire to be reborn there, and then we are, Mm -hmm. at the time of death so so here's what i wonder if you can explain to me um to my very small brain so we could be reborn in what is basically the state of enlightenment but not really be enlightened yet and still need to work at it i get that and yes it's kind of like all that so here's here's the deal uh, the buddha shakyamuni um said that uh, even he could not grant enlightenment to another person so but the fact of the matter is there's a connection between amitabha's promise and our confidence in that promise there's a there's a list and i'm going to have I'm, i'll show it to you in a second about of the four causes to be reborn in the pure realm one of them is uh is imagining that the pure realm is there and that you are in it and that and so that you have this sense of the presence of the Buddha Amitabha. The second one is that you uh, make the aspiration to be reborn there. And the third is that you, um, you purify your negativity and you uh, dedicate your virtue uh, through uh, offerings and so forth, uh, mental offerings and so on. And uh, the fourth one just went out of my mind. So I'm going to have to put the list up on the um, on the viewer here. But the but the bottom line is that right now we experience being in a world. We're experiencing being in our world. And so what will happen after death in this scenario of a person who imagines they're in the presence as they're passing away, they imagine they're in the presence of the Buddha Amitabha, their mind is aligned with the Buddha Amitabha. And what happens at the time of death when the body and mind come apart, and this is a, for a whole nother teaching, this is part of a whole nother teaching about death and dying in Buddhist tradition. But when the mind and body come apart, gradually as the, um, as the different senses wane, as our different, uh, different sense, uh, sense experiences wane, negative mental afflictions also are momentarily muted. So our, um, our attachment is muted, our aversion is muted, and our ignorance finally is muted. And at that moment, when, with, when these uh, negative mental afflictions have been muted, what happens then is that our mind has very little to do except to experience itself. And when it can experience itself in this way, then when one passes from this life, even if, one, even if one has not attained Buddhahood at that moment, one has created the cause to be reborn in a specific location. Just as I have, uh, I have heard stories told of, base, of human beings who have made the aspiration to be reborn in a specific locality in this world, and it's happened because we all have read the case studies of reincarnation where people made the aspiration to return to their family or made the aspiration to go and do and be something in specific and it happened. So, I mean, so we know that this is possible to actually have a different experience and experience a different locality in our mind. And so I'm, I am actually giving everybody the benefit of the doubt here. I do believe that the, the Buddha Amitabha actually does exist. I actually do believe, because just as I believe that all of you exist and that I exist and that we all have our own little mandalas around us right now and that, you know, mine's really pretty confused. Uh, I try to make it look nice, but it's, you know, it's still, I'm still an unenlightened being, but I do understand that because of the, of the, prov of the process of, I'm going to call it distillation or the, the, the process of dying allows these mental afflictions to be muted, 
then we can actually meditate if we've trained. And if we haven't trained, we can rely on the wish to be reborn in Dewa Chen as the object of our meditation. When uh, Brad Butters was uh, dying of cancer, uh, he's a member of the Columbus KTC who passed away a number of years ago, he actually had Kempo Kartha Rinpoche at his bedside five days before he died. Now, what kind of karma makes that happen? I mean, he had a lot of amazing karma because Rinpoche was right there five days before he died to give him advice. And what did he tell him? He said, put your mind 100% on the conviction that you will be reborn in the presence of the Buddha Amitabha. He said, don't think about anything else. Just stay with that. He said, and then when you arise there, you know, again, you will see the Buddha Amitabha, you will have the illumination of, of being a first level bodhisattva, and it will come very easily to you. And then he said, then you can uh, turn and look back at all of the people you left behind and you can help them. You can, you can, he said, basically, you can send emanations to benefit them in their lives. And so he, I think he knew that Bradley was worried about his family and he wanted him to know that he would not, by being reborn in Dewa Chen, he would be abandoning no one. He would just increase his capacity. So yes, we're, we're, uh, we are unenlightened when we are reborn in Dewa Chen, but it's, it's a, it's a pretty fast, you're on a fast track and you don't have any obstacles because there's no suffering. That's why they call it the blissful because, you know, so I know, and this is asking a lot, but here's the deal. A lot of people say, gosh, this kind of sounds like the church I left. And I thought that was kind of bogus, you know? So like you guys are asking the same thing, what gives? But the fact of the matter is our mind is what we take with us everywhere. Our mind goes with us everywhere. It never leaves us. And so if we can train our mind in love, compassion, and wisdom, that is what our future life will manifest, regardless of whether there is or is not a Buddha Amitabha, regardless of whether there is or is not a Dewa Chen, we're going to be reborn somewhere. That is a certainty. And if we can guide through wisdom and compassion, if we can guide our rebirth, then we should really try if we have the capacity to do that. I mean, we're guiding the next moment that we're thinking right now. Those of you who watched Minja Rinpoche's teaching on Dewa Chen, um, by the way, that's something you can look up online. Uh, Mingyu Rinpoche gave a wonderful teaching on the four causes of being reborn in Dewa Chen. And, um, and he's, um, he's an extremely um, gifted teacher. And he was talking about the idea that we're actually reborn every moment. We are reborn every moment that we have a thought and believe in the reality of that thought. When, when we think that uh, our life is a, a, is a triumph, you know, oh, my life is great. Then we're for that little period of time, we're reborn in the life of that in the world of that thought. And then we pass away. When that thought ends, we pass away from the world of that thought. We can also think, oh, my life is terrible. And we'll stay there for as long as that thought lasts. And then we'll pass away out of the world of that thought and we'll go on to the next one. So in a way we're being reborn all the time anyway. And that this is why the bodhisattva motivation to benefit not just ourselves, but others is so crucial because we're programming our future experience all the time. We're always doing it all the time. And why not? If we are doing that, why not make our goal day watch in? So there's that. So thank you. So Kim, kind of an answer. Okay. Other things that people might want to know. I'm going to take questions for another five minutes or so, and then we'll break. We'll have a break. We have a couple of questions in the chat now, Lama Kathy. Yeah, okay. Let me see if I can find them. Oh, yeah, here we go. Uh, let's see. Does this apply to the long Amitabha practice as well? Um, I'm not entirely clear on what your question is by this applying. Uh, can, you, can you elaborate? Hi, Lama Kathy. Hey. Hi. Um, so 
the background and the uh, information that you're giving on uh, uh, Anitana at Day Watch Inn, I I would assume that, that this is the the same concept, the same engine behind both the short practice and the long practice, regardless of which one you're practicing. That's a re that's exactly right. Um, there are um, there are numerous practices of Amitabha in the Pure Land. Numerous. There's a bunch uh, of them in uh, the um, in the Mahayana in China, Japan, Korea. There's Pure Land Buddhism. They have their own practices of it. So yeah, same same Buddha Amitabha, same Pure Realm, different supplications different methods of practicing toward those four factors of being reborn in the pure realm. And because the four factors for being reborn in the pure realm are in the Amitabha Sutras and all of these different Mahayana schools subscribe to the, the teachings of the Amitabha Sutras, those are universal. The actual words of the prayers, they're gonna vary by tradition and, um, and school of Buddhism and so forth, but they're all aiming in the same direction. So uh, Namo Amitofo, which many people know uh, the, as a Chinese supplication to the Buddha Amitabha, it's it's the same as Om Ami Dewa Hri, you know, because it's it's because Namo Amitofo is a way of saying Amitabha's name in Chinese. I mean, in Sanskrit, because Sanskrit is Namo. Amitofo is then uh, uh, you know, Chinese. So, you know, so that it's, and when we say Om, Ami, Dewa, Hri, which is the Tibetan version of Amitabha's name mantra, we're saying the same thing, essentially. So hope that helps. Okay, then let's see. Uh, I've seen in Japanese Buddhism Amitabha as well, but not pictured as red as their reason he's red. Uh, oh, yeah. Um, the uh, five Buddhas, each one of the five Buddhas of the five Buddha families <clears throat> has a different color associated with their manifestation. And so in teachings that explain the five Buddha families, each one of these colors has to do with the, um, the, um, both the wisdom that they personify and the mental affliction, the mental affliction that they um, overcome. And so red, the color red is associated with attachment and desire. And, uh, and then oh, the kind of wisdom, the discriminating awareness wisdom, which is what the Buddha Amitabha exemplifies is also symbolized by that. So, uh, and so uh, I'm sure he's visualized in lots of different ways in lots of different cultures and, and teachings. So, and they're all, and they're all good. I don't think there's there's any one way that's not good. I mean, it's like Chenrezig, right? The Bodhisattva of compassion. Avalokiteshvara in Sanskrit, right? Chenrezi in Tibetan. And then Kuan Yin in the various Asian uh, Buddhist traditions. So, and what's great is that Chenrezig is, uh, Avalokiteshvara and Chenrezig are male and, uh, and uh, Kuan Yin is female. It's all good. I mean, you know, it's it's all good. So I, I think there's no there's no there's no inconsistency here. Uh, let's see. So okay, here's the last question. So one time I offered to pray that at that time of a Buddhist friend's death, I would pray for her to be reborn in Amitabha's pure realm. But she told me she'd be oh, I would prefer to be reborn in Tara's pure realm. So there are other pure realms. Yes, there are. And there are, yes, there are other pure realms. Kempo Karthar Rinpoche uh, was, a, he was an Amitabha fan. He, he, he like studied everything he could about Amitabha. And so that meant he not only studied the Amitabha Sutras, which he said convinced him that being reborn in the pure realm of Amitabha was the best of all pure realms. And he also studied all of the compositions of the great 16th century Saint Karma Chagme, who, who himself was considered an emanation of Amitabha. So Karma Chagme wrote extensively on the Buddha Amitabha and Rinpoche read all of that. And he said he was completely and totally convinced uh, about the existence of uh, Dewa Chen and so on. And, uh, and in the very long prayer to be reborn in Dewa Chen, written by Karma Chagme, Rinpoche quoted it for us saying, 
you can go to Tara's Pure Realm in the morning, you know, and then go to and then return to Sukhavati in the evening. So somebody asked him, well, what's that all about? And he said, well, he said, Amitabha's Pure Realm is the only Pure Realm that's open to ordinary beings to be reborn in. All of the rest of them, you have to be first level bodhisattvas before you die. And then you can experience the pure realms of the other Buddhas because they didn't make the same aspiration that the Buddha Amitabha made. So he said, technically, it's better to be reborn in Dewa Chen because then you can go anywhere. <laughs> so I said, sounds practical. And we know that our Rinpoche was always very practical. Okay. Um, uh, is, there, uh, is there any more? If there's one more, I have time. Okay. Well, in that case, um, we will take our seven minute break now. Uh, so let's see, uh, on my clock, it is now 11 minutes past the hour. So I will see you at 18 minutes past the hour. I'm turning off my video and, and sound and I'll see you in just a few minutes. And start. Okay, thanks. Thanks for coming back. I appreciate it. Um, there's uh, one question that came in during the break, and I'll go ahead and answer that one. And then we'll move on to the topic of um, the four causes of being reborn in Dewa Chen. And then after that, we'll uh, do um, a quick run through of the um, parts of the uh, short Amitabha sadhana that we know and love at Columbus KTC. The, uh, the question is, um, uh, can you explain what it means to be a first level bodhisattva? Yes, um, I'm going to base my explanation on the description in Gampopa's book, The Jewel Ornament of Liberation, because in the 12th century, uh, Gampopa uh, gave, he wrote this book about the entirety of the Buddhist path from um, the, the working basis of Buddha nature, from the working basis of having Buddha nature to the accomplishment of, Buddha, of one's Buddha nature, the promise of one's Buddha nature, which is full Buddhahood. So the book starts with us having Buddha nature and it concludes with us attaining full Buddhahood. And then in between, Gampopa describes all of the phases of a, per, of a person's training in, in Dharma, from meeting a teacher, receiving the teacher's instructions, and then uh, brief statements of all of the major teachings on uh, on um, ethics and on morality, on uh, the lay precepts, on the bodhisattva vow, and then describing the bodhisattva path in detail by describing the six perfect virtues, which are generosity, uh, ethics, patience, diligence, meditation, and wisdom. And so by describing the six perfect virtues, when that section is finished, then he talks about uh, the uh, how a person progresses through what are called the 10 bodhisattva levels. Um, in the sutras, 10 levels of bodhisattva awakening are described. And in the tantras, 13 levels of bodhisattva awakening are described. I'm not a scholar, and so I can't tell you the differences. But what I can, what I can say is that right now we are completely enmeshed in confusion. I think that's the safest way to describe our current condition here in samsara is that we're completely enmeshed in confusion. In fact, we are so enmeshed in confusion that even our experience of perception itself is clouded by illusion. So um, I'm gonna use my glass of, uh, my glass of juice is gone. So now I must use my glass of water. So um, now, uh, so the, the glass of water here, I am relating to it as though it were solid, real, permanent, unchanging, something I must have. And even my initial perception of it instantaneously arises with confusion about what it really is. I don't have a sense of what it really is. I just know what I say it to, to be, or I think it to be. And so this, this process is called, uh, I'm gonna type it into chat. I just realized I should have been typing names into chat and I apologize for that. Um, um, uh, oh gosh. 
This is called co-emergent confusion. By co-emergent, it means the instant you have a perception of something, it instantly arises with confusion. You, you, you get it wrong instantly. You don't see its true nature. And the Buddha said that the true nature of all things, as well as the true nature of mind, is, um, is a limitlessness, limitlessness, or some people use the word emptiness, but emptiness tends, some people think it, it's the number zero. So I prefer to use the word limitlessness. Nothing is established as being permanent and, and so forth. So limitless, the basic nature of everything is unestablished. And, um, and, that, and because, and, we, and the nature of our mind also is said to be limitlessness, but the second aspect of our mind is, uh, sorry, I can't spell, luminosity. Um, this idea is that mind has an experiential quality to it. Some people call it the, the cognitive quality or the cognitive lucidity of our mind. Our mind can know things. So even though the mind is not a material thing, it is nonetheless not nothing. It's not a thing, but it's not nothing because it experiences. And this, this unity of emptiness and lucidity is called the nature of mind. And so uh, when a person practices uh, the practices of awakening, whether it's the practice of mantra, love and compassion, uh, or um, the practices of um, uh, Mahamudra and other types of deep penetrating insight meditation, what they come to discover is something called a co-emergent wisdom. And this cannot be described. And it has to be, a, a person has to be trained to experience it. And so uh, that when we first experience this uh, co-emergent wisdom, this is said to be the first level of uh, bodhisattva awakening. And so I think uh, what I would suggest you do is, um, is uh, get hold of, um, I think Tranga Rinpoche has a, um, has a version of the uh, jewel ornament. Uh, the, book, the book itself, the jewel ornament of liberation is by Gampopa, uh, but the, um, the Jewel Ornament of Liberation is uh, by Gampopa, uh, but the, uh, a modern day commentary on it by uh, Tranga Rinpoche is very good. And that will help you to understand the differences between the Bodhisattva levels and so on. I hope that's helpful. So thank you for that. Okay. So, um, so next, um, what I'm going to do is um, go over one more time, just uh, so that we have, so that we have it, we have an understanding of it. I'm going to try to share screen, see if it'll work. Here we go. Uh, these are um, known as the uh, the the four factors, the four factors. And, uh, and for the uh, rebirth in the land of bliss, which is what Dewa Chen is called. Uh, hang on a second here. I've, I've got to move my few things on my screen. There we go. Uh, first, uh, the support. Imagining the field of accumulation, meaning imagining the pure realm. One inwardly imagines the land of bliss as a beautiful and pleasant place. One sees Amitabha with his two attendant bodhisattvas, Avalokiteshvara and Vajrapani at his side, and all around him are innumerable arhats and bodhisattvas. One imagines that they are really present in front of us. So that's the first of the causes to be reborn in Dewa Chen, is, is to have the support of the field of accumulation. So uh, we have to collect these four factors. So that's the first. The second is the fundamental cause, uh, the accumulation and purification. In front of the support that one uh, visualizes, one presents through one's imagination, infinite offerings, homage is given with your body, speech, and mind. We confess our faults committed during innumerable past lives, and we believe that these are purified by being confessed. 
And um, um, in all of the descriptions, this is only one of several descriptions of the four causes. So this may or may not match with other versions of the four causes that you have read. But um, it's, it's stated that one must, uh, sometimes in this second one, it's, it says that one must continue to um, collect uh, virtue, meaning accomplish virtue and refrain from wrongdoing. Because if a person uh, says, oh, well, I'm going to make the aspiration to be reborn in Dewa Chan, so I can do anything I want to in this lifetime, and, 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 and it won't prevent me from being reborn in Dewa Chan. So <laughs> uh, that is kind of not workable. So uh, that, that, that doesn't go with being reborn in Dewa Chan. So th this second cause helps to remind us that we cannot just do negative things and uh, think, oh, well, now I can be reborn in Dewa Chen. The auxiliary factor is engendering the mind of awakening or the mind of Bodhi Chitta. Bodhi means awakening and Chitta means mind. One develops compassion for all beings, particularly in connection with the land of bliss by formulating wishes always in the presence of thinking that one is in the presence of, when you see the words field of accumulation, it really means that you're in the presence of the Buddha Amitabha. We can think things such as, may all beings be free of suffering and have happiness. May they all be reborn in the land of bliss. May I myself take rebirth in the land of bliss and lead all beings there. So the idea is then engendering bodhicitta. So some people uh, have asked Kempo Kartha Rinpoche in the past, well, when we take the Bodhisattva vow to liberate all sentient beings, aren't we sort of like reneging on that vow of the Bodhisattva by being reborn in the land of bliss? And he said, that's an excellent question. And a lot of people think that. He said, but you have to remember that when you uh, become awakened, when you arise as a first level Bodhisattva in the pure realm of Dewa Chen. He said, you instantly, and you have to read the jewel ornament of liberation about this, um, you are instantly able to emanate in 100 different places simultaneously. And so you can actually, he said, have more capacity to carry out your Bodhisattva vow if you are reborn in the land of bliss than you would if you were not reborn there. In fact, Kemper Rinpoche, and I tell this story uh, frequently, he said uh, one time he said in, in the presence of me and a bunch of other people, he said, I need to, to, to correct the record here. He said, I made a mistake. And we're all like, what? Kemper Rinpoche made a mistake? What could that possibly be? He said, a long time ago, he said, when I was asked is it better to be reborn with your Vajrayana master or is it better to be reborn in Dewa Chen? I said Vajrayana master and I was wrong. <laughs> he said, because if you, even though the Vajrayana is a quicker path than the path of the Mahayana, which takes a little longer, it takes uh, <clears throat> eons. Anyhow, but uh, but, you know, you kind of like subvert that by going to Dewa Chen and arising as a first level Bodhisattva, you kind of like make it shorter. Anyhow, uh, he said, I used to think that because Vajrayana is famed as the quick path, that that would be the best place to be reborn with your Vajrayana master. But then I realized that when you are reborn with your Vajrayana master, frequently, in fact, virtually always, you are reborn in samsara. And so he said, in samsara, a lot of stuff can happen. A lot of stuff can go wrong. Uh, he said, even if you're born in the presence of your master, you can make a mistake. You can fall away from your master. You can, you can like go into lower realms. All kinds of things can happen to you in, in, uh, in samsara. So he said, if you're reborn in Dewa Chen, there are no problems. You don't have the same disadvantages of being reborn in, in samsara because Dewa Chen is not in samsara. It is beyond samsara. And so uh, I, you know, that, that he said, so I just need to correct the record and say that I made that mistake. He said, now I am firmly believe that we should all be reborn in Dewa Chen. Now, what's really cool about this is that it is possible it is possible that I was the only person in that audience who actually heard him say it the first time. He actually said it in Columbus at a teaching he gave in somebody's living room back in the old days. 
and I was there. And I may have been the only person who was in both crowds, but it was just like, it just like blew my mind. I mean, he, that was his mind. That was the kind of mind he had. And then uh, finally, the fourth condition, the operating condition is to make perfect wishes. Basically you engender the deep aspiration and thinking, may I take rebirth in the land of bliss? So um, by the way, this is uh, based on a teaching of, um, of Kalu Rinpoche in one of his books. The previous Kalu Rinpoche, uh, there were a number of books. He says, um, when, one, when these four factors are gathered, it is almost impossible not to take rebirth in the land of bliss. However, there is a risk of an obstacle that might prevent us from doing so. That would be our egocentric grasping, which makes us very attached to relatives, parents, children, husband, wife, or friends. At death, our consciousness will experience the bardo, but because of the wish for rebirth in the land of bliss, the aspiration will arise in our mind after we arise, and we will think, I am going to the land of bliss. This thought by itself gives the necessary impetus, and we will have the impression, we'll have the impression that we're flying through space to reach our destination. Uh, it is there that attachment to our close friends and relations risks being a counterbalance. If our attachment to them is very strong, we will hear the voice of the person to whom we remain. Attach, tell us, don't abandon me, don't go to the land of bliss. This voice will be very clear and convincing. The power of attachment will then lead us back to the person who calls. We will turn back and the wish to go to the land of bliss will leave our mind. And there is a method to avoid this danger. Let us consider that from now on, our own body belongings and all to which we are attached form a mandala that we offer to the Buddha Amitabha. We think all of this I offer to you. Henceforth, it no longer belongs to me, but to you alone. The benefit of this offering is twofold. It allows us to accumulate merit and, and decreases de atta attachment. Especially when touched by fatal illness, we must think with great force, I am going to die soon. My body is the support of the illness and the sufferings that I now endure, but it no longer belongs to me. I have offered it to the Buddha Amitabha. All those who are dear to me, parents, children, spouse, brothers, sisters, and friends, I have also offered them to Amitabha. I no longer need to take care of them. It is Amitabha who will care for them. This illness will lead me to death, and I am happy because I am going to leave this world of suffering to go to the land of bliss. And in this way, no obstacle will be able to prevent our rebirth there. The power of the mind is great. Mind has the energy to achieve its goals, and the and uh, the more if it, and all the more if it relies on uh, faith in the Buddha's bodhisattvas and masters. Because of time, uh, we'll have to stop uh, here. But this uh, this is um, is going to be posted, uh, and it will be in, uh, on the uh, Eventbrite uh, website for this event, and it will also be included in the uh, email that is sent out tomorrow evening. Uh, which will have all of the links to all of the uh, documents, and it will also have the link to the YouTube video for, for this lesson. So, um, uh, so for this reason, uh, Rinpoche, um, uh, Kemp, I mean, Kemp Rinpoche basically said, this is how I made uh, this mistake, and this is how I'm correcting the mistake. So uh, he, was, he was an amazing master. The, the next thing I'd like to uh, share with everyone is a little bit about the, uh, the, the short sadhana of the Buddha Amitabha. Um, here we go. Uh, those of you who uh, attend uh, the Columbus KTC Amitabha practice every week um, uh, will know about the Amitabha sadhana, and it and these are the parts of it. This uh, this sadhana was written in the 16th century by uh, the great uh, master uh, Yang, uh, not Yangi, uh, Namchu Minjur Dorje. There's there there were two Mingyur Rinpoches. One was Yangge, Mingyur Rinpoche, who is uh, reincarnated as the young Minjur Rinpoche we know and love today, and then the other is Namchu uh, Minjur Dorje, uh, and his reincarnation is in Asia. So here are parts of the Amitabha sadhana, refuge in bodhicitta. We all remember that anything that is Buddhist will begin with taking refuge and engendering the mind of bodhicitta. The second part is a visualization where we transform ourselves into the bodhisattva chenrezig and the universe around us into the pure realm. 
Next, we invite uh, the, um, the real Buddhas and Bodhisattvas uh, from Dewa Chen, and they come and merge with the imagined Dewa Chen that we imagine in front of us. We uh, praise uh, Amitabha Buddha. We uh, supplicate him uh, to be reborn in his pure realm. And then, uh, we, uh, and then we recite uh, as Chen Rezi in the presence of uh, the Buddha Amitabha, with actually uh, uh, knowing that in the center of our heart, as um, Chen Rezi is the Buddha Amitabha in the entire pure realm of Dewa Chen is within us, which is highly, um, it's highly um, effective in helping us remember that the pure realm is always within us. And then we visualize that as part of our mantra recitation. Then we uh, recite the mantra. We then uh, dissolve the visualization. Uh, and then we uh, rest in meditation for a moment. And then uh, we practice the post meditation. Then there's a prayer uh, of aspiration to be reborn in Dewa Chen. And then there's a prayer of aspiration to increase virtue and to be reborn in Dewa Chen. There's two prayers, a shorter one and a longer one. And then we dedicate the merit. So as you can see, this is a complete practice beginning with refuge in bodhicitta and ending with dedication. And in the middle are all of the accumulations of merit and wisdom. Merit by making offerings and supplication and reciting the mantra and meditation being the accumulation of wisdom. So I wanted to make sure I covered that with you. And then uh, the, the next part will be looking at the sadhana itself. Um, let's see. Okay. Again, the uh, the outline for this will the outline for this um, will be uh, shared with you at the conclusion. Oh, uh, just uh, just for fun, uh, here's Day Watch N. Let's see if we can see if I can put that. There we go. This is uh, part. Uh, this is the uh, Buddha Amitabha, uh, and uh, Chen Rezi is on this side, and then Vajrapani is on that side. And then uh, we imagine this beautiful pure realm, and in the and in the center, in the in the in the middle, there's a little pond, and in that pond is a lotus flower. And guess what? That's us. We are rising in Dewa Chen in a lotus flower. <laughs> Pretty cool, right? So the the pure realm of Dewa Chen that we visualize in the center of our heart, as well as being in front of us, is uh, is in is described here, and this will also be shared with everybody. So now the text. Uh, this will be just a very brief uh, review of, uh, of the text. Let's see if I can bring it. Here we go. Okay. All the technical aspects of, of teaching a class on Zoom. So uh, this is um, the, uh, the abridged uh, sadhana uh, recitation of maha, meaning great sukhavati, meaning Dewa Chen, the realm of bliss. And uh, so it begins with refuge in bodhicitta. You'll recognize namo, kunchuk sundam sawasum, chapne namla chapsuchi, and so on. Homage to the sources of refuge, the three jewels and the three roots. Remember, you, you wonder why I explained that at the beginning. I go for refuge to establish all beings in Buddhahood. I generate the supreme enlightened mind. Uh, so this is um, this is the is the taking of refuge. The next part uh, you see here: meto chuke pe me tang denan rani senpakar on a, a lotus flower. Uh, the, uh, the waterborne, I uh, appear as the white bodhisattva Chenrezig, and uh, you can uh, visualize yourself as Chenrezi, and uh, with all of his uh, his accoutrements and uh, and and so forth. And your body is made of light; it is not made of flesh and blood anymore. For the purposes of this practice, we imagine that we are made fully of beautiful light, shining in. Uh, an effulgence, as they say, of the five colors. It's like luminescent. And, uh, and then uh, in front of me, as uh, I am Chen Rezi, in front of me on a lotus and moon disc, it's the protector, Amitabha, red in color, 
with one face and two hands resting in the mudra of equanimity that's in his lap, holding a begging bowl. He wears the Dharma robes of a monastic and he sits in the Vajra posture. On his right is the powerful Lord of the universe, Chenrezig, white in color. So uh, there's a standing Chenrezig on, on his right side, which will be our left as we look at him from the, from the front. Uh, Chen Rezi has one face and four arms. The palms of the first two hands are joined together at his heart. The second right holds a circle of beads. The right hand holds a rosary and the left a lotus. Right rosary, left lotus. He stands on a lotus and moon disc. On Amitabha's left is Vajrapani, the great powerful one. He's the, uh, he's the bodhisattva who, when the Buddha was teaching the Vajrayana, he said, who will protect this Vajrayana doctrine? Vajrapani stepped forward and said, I will. And so in that way, he became the protector of Vajrayana teachings. Uh, v Vajrapani uh, looks similar to Chenrezig. Uh, he has uh, one face, two arms, but he is blue in color. His right hand holds uh, uh, a Vajra and his left one a bell, symbolic of the practice of Vajrayana, which is the, the unity of, of skillful means and wisdom. The bell symbolizes wisdom and the dorje uh, skillful means. Vajrapani stands on a lotus and moon disc. Numberless Buddhas, bodhisattvas, shravakas, and arhats surround them. And so the entire realm of Dewa Chen is in front of us, but the entire realm of Dewa Chen is also inside our heart as uh, Chenrezig. And uh, everybody is where they belong, meaning that uh, Chenrezig is on. Uh, is on Amitabha's right, Vajrapani is on his left, inside our heart, and they're all made of brilliant, beautiful light. And so it says here in the three places uh, uh, of the three main deities, so that's uh, Amitabha, Chenrezig, and Vajrapani, and also in your heart, Amitabha, Chenrezig, and Vajrapani, from the three places, meaning their forehead, their throat, and their heart. Forehead, throat, and heart. These symbolize the body, the speech, and the mind. The forehead's associated with the body, the throat, the speech, and the heart, the mind. So there are, uh, you can see seed syllables at these three places, or you can merely see spheres of light that are white at the forehead, red, at the throat and blue at the heart. And also slightly below in the center of the body, there is a seed syllable in each one of these. And uh, unfortunately I don't have them all memorized. So I, I, I have now forgotten what Vajrapani's seed syllable is. So I'm gonna to have to not, in, in order not to mislead you, I will not tell you what it is because uh, I would not know for sure. So you can see coming from the seed syllable in the heart of Vajrapani, as well as Chenrezig, as well as Amitabha, and also from the three places, their forehead, throat, and heart, lights radiate outward. Kempo Karthar Rinpoche in describing this says, it's like the light that comes from the filament of a light bulb. The light that comes from the filament in the center of a light bulb shines outward in all directions. And so these lights then shine out from our heart and also from, I mean, from the deities that are in our heart as Chenrezi, as well as all of the deities we have visualized in front of us. These lights go out and they strike the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas in the, the pure realms and, uh, and invite them to be present with us. And so then we imagine that these Buddhas and Bodhisattvas come and they hover around us. And as they hover, we say, we say these words of invocation, Om Ami Dewa Hri, which is uh, Amitabha's mantra, Benza Samayadza, meaning through your, uh, through your Vajra commitment, please come. Through your Vajra commitment, please come. Om Ami Dewa Hri. This is the address. This is who we're addressing. Benza Samayadza. There is a mudra that goes with this. And I will have to show these on a video rather than trying to do them on Zoom. It's a little too difficult. 
but uh, and we don't really have enough time to go through them thoroughly. So I'll find a way to make an extra video for you that we'll also post on uh, YouTube so that you can see how these phrases and how the mudras go together. Uh, rather than uh, sh give you, uh, be too short on the visualization, I'll do the mudras as separately as a separate video. So Om Ami Dewa Hri Bensa Samayadza, through your Vajra commitment, unshakable commitment, please come. And then when we say the words Za Hum Bam Ho, which means from front, from top to bottom and side to side, you know, the, that's what this mudra means, you know, completely and utterly do you, you dissolve. And so we see all of these Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, actually the wisdom ones, wisdom deities dissolve into the visualized deities that we have placed in front of us and that we have in our heart as generosity. We see them merge and become one. And that now we don't have to say to ourselves, Am I really, am I really in the presence of the Buddha Amitabha? We can know by, by merging the wisdom deities with the imagined ones, we can know that we are truly in the presence of the Buddha Amitabha and his retinue. And also we can know that they are present in our heart. Sahum bam ho, tiktra len ati puho. Tiktra len means please be seated on uh, this lotus seat because we've created little lotus seats for them. Ati Puho, you know, may, may, this, uh, may you be here with us in this way. And then we imagine that, uh, again, from the heart of ourself as Chenra Zig, and then from all of the Buddhas in front of us, lights radiate, inviting the Buddhas, uh, uh, the, the five male and the five female Buddhas of the Buddha families. They come from the pure realms. And <laughs> the, the, the male Buddhas sit in meditation, and the female Buddhas take up uh, pictures of, uh, of Amrita, the, the wisdom Amrita, the wisdom of blessing, blessing wisdom. And they pour this into the heads of, the, of ourself and others and those in front of us. And so that we are completely empowered with, uh, with the five Buddha families. And that's the meaning of Om Hong Tram Hri Ah. Those are the seed syllables of the five Buddhas. Abhikinsa Mam is uh, may we be empowered by them. So now not only do we think we've been empowered uh, by the wisdom deities dissolving into us, we have been filled with blessings by them. And so there can be no doubt now that we are in the presence of the real Buddhas and that, that we have them present within us. And then from our hearts emanate, uh, from our heart emanates offering goddesses who offer argam, which is water for uh, drinking, pajam, which is a water for washing, pupe, which are flowers, dupe, which is incense, aloke, which are lamps, gende, which is uh, perfume, newide, which is food, and shabda, which is a uh, music. Ahung is this is uh, may this be offered, and so uh, through what's happened here is that the lights have gone out from the imagined deities, both inside us and in front of us. We invite the real deities to be with them. We imagine that they dissolve from top to bottom and side to side. Uh, that they have been seated uh, on this uh, lotus seat and that they remain with us. Then we imagine that lights go out and then and become offering goddesses then who, um, who um, uh, I'm sorry, not offering goddesses, that, that's the last part. Lights come out from us and invite the empowering deities who then uh, through meditation and through pouring the uh, wisdom on Rita, uh, then fill us up completely with blessings. And we imagine that we are empowered by them. Then the, uh, the offering goddesses emanate and offer water uh, for drinking, washing, uh, flowers, incense, lamps, perfume, food, and music. So now it's been, uh, we've done quite a lot. We've, we've brought the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas uh, into our presence and into our hearts. We've imagined uh, making offerings to them and uh, so on. And uh, then in the next prayer, uh, we say, Hong, Dei Chen Shingdu Chuki Korlo Kor. Uh, Hong, in the pure land of great bliss, you turn the wheel of Dharma and always look upon sentient beings with compassion, fulfilling your commitment to protect all beings. 
We offer uh, prostrations to you, Amitabha, whose hands rest in the mudra of equanimity. And so then after this, we, we make our uh, supplication. Emaho means, it, isn't it amazing? You know, I, I mean, Emaho, wondrous, great wonder. The wondrous Buddha, Ngotsar uh, Sanjay Nawa Taeda, the wondrous Buddha of infinite light. Sanjay means Buddha, Nangwa Taye means a boundless light. Uh, the wondrous Buddha of infinite light, the great compassionate one, Chenrezig, the great powerful one, Vajrapani, and all countless Buddhas and Bodhisattvas with a mind of one pointed devotion, I supplicate, please bestow the supreme city. Bless me to accomplish Amitabha. And then uh, after having made that aspiration and supplication, then uh, we recite these words, beginning with Lasso Kule Uzer Nupchok Tru, uh, from the bodies, it's a visualization description, from the bodies of the assembled deities, which are assembled in front of us, lights radiate to the west, uh, from the pure land of Dewa Chen, Amitabha's form, strings of his mantra, and hand symbols in immeasurable numbers fall like rain and are absorbed into me. And so the idea is that from our, from the, from the center of our hearts come light. Uh, from the center of the Buddha Amitabha and heart comes light and it shines outward and uh, makes uh, offerings to and invites uh, the uh, Buddhas uh, from the realm of Amitabha. And then they send their blessings back in the form of little Amitabhas, big Amitabhas, little begging bowls, big begging bowls, and strings of his mantra in red shining light. And, uh, and they, they fall on us like rain. This particular method of visualization is called the descent of blessings. Uh, I'll type that. It's the descent of blessings form of uh, visualization. And you'll see this uh, form uh, in uh, all of the Namchu uh, uh, treasure texts. It's also in Medicine Buddha. You'll see it also in Medicine Buddha, and it's also in forms of uh, Jawa Jamso or Red Chen Rezi practice. So the idea is that from our heart comes this light, and it goes to the pure realm, and then the deities in the pure realm send back their blessings. Trungpa Rinpoche, in his book Medicine Buddha Teaching, says that when these, uh, when these, uh, this rain of of blessings and the forms of big and little Amitabhas, big and little hand, you know, uh, um, begging bowls, big and little um, mantra strings. When they rain into us, he said, we should think of two things. Number one, we should think that this rain of blessings purifies all that is wrong within us. It purifies all of our obstacles, all of our negative karma, all of our um, habitual tendencies, all of our negative mental afflictions, it purifies everything that's wrong. And then the second thing it does is it gives us everything we need. So you can see that happening in two phases. Phase one is purification. Phase two is where we receive all that we need. And you can do this as you recite Om Ami Dewa Shri repeatedly. You can think, may all, of these, uh, may all of these negativities be purified in the first phase, second phase, may I receive everything I need. Because some of us, we may, we may think that we need more compassion. We may think that we need more wisdom. We may think th that we need um, more strength, more patience. And we can imagine the lights and this rain of blessings giving us all of those things that we need. Uh, after the recitation of um, the um, um, after the recitation of the I'm pausing the screen sharing for just a moment uh, after the uh, recitation of Omami Dewa Shri, we then uh, recite um, the the short mantra of Amitabha or the seed syllable mantra of Amitabha, which is Hri H R I Hri. And so um, then when we are reciting free, it's a complex visualization that I will, I will, I'm reading, I'm going to be reading part of the reason I've, uh, I've paused the, um, 
the sharing is because I'm reading from my other text. Uh, this is based on Kempo Carthur Rinpoche's instruction. There is in your heart the entire realm of Dewa Chen. Remember, the Buddha Amitabha is in the center, Chen Rezi is on his right, Vajrapani is on his left. Well, inside that tiny Amitabha in your heart is a moon disk that's flat, a little flat moon disk that's like a cushion. And on top of that is a little red free. Sorry, I'm having trouble. <laughs> Siri, Siri wants to talk to me. She thinks I'm talking to her. So, um, so, and on that, uh, on that, that little uh, seed syllable, okay, from that comes little, a little row of freeze, okay, there's like, a, it, it emanates little freeze. And as it comes out in a continuous chain, as you can continue reciting free, 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 the freeze exit the mouth of the Buddha Amitabha in your heart and then rise and come out of your mouth as Chenrezig in a continuous chain. And this continuous chain of freeze then goes into the mouth of the Amitabha in front of you as an offering. And then it proceeds down into his heart in front of you. The freeze pass through his heart and are blessed by him and comes out the navel of the Amitabha that is in front of us. And it then comes in an unbroken chain into your navel. Remember your chin raisy, right? And then goes into the navel of the Amitabha in your heart and then comes out again. So this chain of connection between your, the Amitabha in your heart the chain of freeze coming out of his mouth and then your mouth and into the mouth of the Amitabha in front of you, down into his heart where it's blessed and then comes out the navel and into your navel as Chenrezig, into the navel of the little Amitabha in your heart. And then coming around and around, this is eventually as it moves, it shines this, this chain of freeze that is moving, it's actually moving. This chain of moving freeze gives off light. And, uh, and then the, these lights shine to benefit all sentient beings. So in this way, you've accomplished the benefit of yourself and the benefit of others. The freeze, then the lights shining from it goes out and uh, and touches other beings and benefits them, purifies them, and so forth. When the recitation of Hrees uh, slows down and begins to stop, the, all that chain of Hrees, moving Hrees, it actually just coalesces into the, the free in the heart of the Amitabha that's in your heart. And that, uh, that is the visualization that happens while you're reciting free. So we've, uh, we've uh, while we were reciting Amitabha's name, lights go from our heart to the pure realm and then his blessings come back in the form of large and small Amitabhas and they rain upon us and benefit us and purify us and give us everything we need. And then the frees emanate and start and form this chain, this moving chain of blessing that then gives off light that benefits all sentient beings. And then the um, and then let's see if I can um, resume the screen share. Let's see if we can see if I can make that work. Well, Kathy, I hadn't wanted to interrupt you before, but your screen share should still be visible, actually. But your picture was also visible. Okay. All right. It okay. So be up. Okay, it's still up. Okay, it's yeah, telling. It's, it. it's giving me a warning. It's giving me a warning that it's not visible. Oh, okay. So, yeah. So. In any case, um, the next line of the practice uh, says um, that, um, let's see, I have, I, have my, I have my handy dandy copy here. Okay, it, uh, it says, De den dungi chum den de udu june ran la tim. In English, then the Buddha in front dissolves into light and is absorbed into myself. And so in that way, 
uh, then what happens after that is that we that the visualization is dissolved. The front Chenrezig and Vajrapani dissolve into the front Amitabha and becomes inseparable with Amitabha. Then the front Amitabha dissolves into light and merges into you as Chenrezig. And then you as Chenrezig dissolve at, from, the, from the bottom to the heart, you know, from the bottom to the middle and the top to the middle and into the three uh, deities in your heart, Chenrezi and Vajrapani into Amitabha, and then Amitabha into the free syllable, and the free slowly dissolves from the bottom to the top until only a dot of light remains, and then that dot of light dissolves into emptiness, and then we rest quietly in emptiness during the period of meditation that concludes that. Now, as you know, if you've attended this uh, sadhana practice before, that there's a bell rung at the conclusion of that meditation. And then we recite the words, Rong Lu Nam Ke Jatsun Tar, Chom Den De Ki Kernang Wa, Sal Dong Zundu Juk Par Jur. And the translation in English is, my body like a rainbow in the sky appears in the form of the Buddha Amitabha. Luminosity and emptiness are a unity. So now you can see that these practices evoke the luminous nature of mind and the deities that we visualize as being made of light, and yet they're empty inside, which is emptiness. So emptiness and luminosity united is what's happening. We're meditating on emptiness and luminosity united when we meditate like this. So, um, so anyway, and after that, we recite Ema Ho and recite the prayers of aspiration to be reborn in Dewa Chen. Now, it's the, in the text, it says we re-arise as the Buddha Amitabha, which is interesting because we were visualizing ourselves as Chenrezig earlier. But I have to tell you something interesting. Kempo Kartha Rinpoche, in his teaching on the Buddha Amitabha, this short sadhana, he had us do something different than that. And I'm guessing it's because of who he was and how he taught us. But here's what he said. As soon as any thought arises in your mind after you've dissolved yourself into emptiness, you've dissolved everything into emptiness. He says, as soon as any thought arises in your mind, immediately without judgment, think that the arising thoughts have no solidity, that they have the nature of purity, luminosity, and clarity, and that everything in samsara is emptiness and luminosity. So I don't know what to say, except wow, Rinpoche gave this really uh, powerful teaching on post-meditation practice. It, he, in, in, when we learn Chenrezig, you re-arise as the deity that you're practicing, and then you get up and walk around, and you're Chenrezig at any time of the day. But what Rinpoche encouraged us to do when we arose from this Amitabha practice was to see all things as luminous emptiness and all thoughts as luminous emptiness, all appearances as luminous emptiness. And I think the reason he did this was so that our connection to the, the, the root virtue of the pure realm you know, the root virtue of the pure realm, which is that it is the purification of everything we experience. Remember, we're, we are all our own little mandala, and right now it's a confused mandala. So what he was having us do by having us visualize everything as luminous emptiness, seeing everything as luminous emptiness, was kind of trying to see how it really is. So, uh, so in any case, um, that's a, a little bit about the post-meditation. And after that, there are two prayers uh, that are recited uh, that uh, ask for us, uh, at, at we, where we ask to be reborn in Dewa Chen. And I'm aware, I see that we have just passed the top of the hour. So our time is up, but I'm going to go ahead and talk for another like five minutes, and then uh, I'll release everybody for the day, just so uh, I can uh, do this. And if you have to leave, I do understand. No problem. You can, you can watch the end uh, in a little bit. Uh, I think I made the introduction a little too long. Anyhow, um, but uh, let's uh, do a, a screen share on the text. 
here it comes. Let's see if we got it. Do we have it? Yep, there it is. Okay, very good. So um, the first words, Emaho, Mozar Sanye Nawa Taeda, Wondrous Buddha of Infinite Light, on your right, the Lord of Great Compassion, Chen Rizik, and on your left, the Bodhisattva of Great Power, Vajrapani, uh, all surrounded. Whoops, sorry. I'm sorry. I made a boo-boo there. Okay. Okay, here we go. Um, let's see, with uh, one, in a mind one put a devotion, I supplicate. Uh, oh, sorry, that's not it. I, I, I switched from one page to another, I apologize. Um, there is wondrous and immeasurable bliss and light in this pure land called Dewa Chen. The moment when I pass from this life without taking another uh, birth, may I be born here and behold the face of Amitabha. Having made this aspiration prayer, may all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas of the 10 directions give their blessing that it be fulfilled without hindrance. Teata Pensandriya Awa Bodha Nai Soha, which Teata Pensandriya Awa Bodha Nai Soha means may this, uh, may this uh, be accomplished just as we have intended. Then, uh, uh, Om, may all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas in the 10 directions and three times think of me. I rejoice in the perfection of the two accumulations of merit and wisdom. All the virtue I have gathered in the three times, past, present, and future, I offer to the three jewels. May the teachings of the victorious one, the Buddha, flourish. I dedicate this virtue to all sentient beings that they may attain enlightenment. May all this virtue gathered together ripen in my mind stream. So the virtue we accomplish, may it may it ripen as Buddhahood. May the two obscurations of negative mental afflictions and, uh, and our basic ignorance that we do not know about the nature of mind and reality, may our basic ignorance and our mental afflictions be purified and the accumulations of merit and wisdom be uh, perfected. May life, health, experience and realization increase in this life, may the 10th level of the Bodhisattva be reached. Instantly, when we depart this life, may we be reborn in Dewa Chen. Once there, may the lotus open. Yes, because we're reborn in a little lotus flower, and may it open. And in that body, may we achieve enlightenment after uh, reaching enlightenment until samsara is empty. May our manifestations uh, guide living beings. The last part, samaya ja ja ja, the idea of um, virtue, 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 and so on is that it's not recited, but it's uh, the author's um, dedication at the conclusion. So we got through the text. Um, and uh, I, uh, yeah, I, I apologize uh, for running over time and uh, appreciate the fact that you've all been able to hang in there. And, uh, and I've made um, a, uh, uh, I, I've, we have now made a recording of today's teaching and you can watch it. And, uh, and then if you have additional questions, uh, you can uh, send them uh, to me at the address uh, that was on the Eventbrite uh, that you received in your Eventbrite emails. And uh, I don't, I don't want uh, to, to uh, ask for questions now. I'm afraid to ask for questions now because then we'll go to like 3.30 and people will be really late for their afternoon. So, um, but if you have any questions, um, let me know. Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, it's like, thank you guys. I really appreciate you being here this afternoon. And I think that uh, probably so that folks can get to their afternoons, I should let you go. But um, let's, uh, let's take a moment to uh, dedicate the goodness of this session. I, I feel so fortunate to have this opportunity to share this. And I, I look forward to sending you uh, the outline because the outline I was reading from you will receive also. So I hope that this has um, given you some things uh, to think about regarding the teachings on the Amitabha Sutras and the, our potential to uh, see each other in the future in Dewa Chen. Kemper of Chase said he's there, so we have to, uh, we have to go too. So um, we gather together all of this goodness and make the aspiration that all beings are freed from suffering, uh, come to happiness and then to Buddhahood. 
I'll recite the short, uh, the short prayer in, uh, in English. Through this merit, may all achieve the omniscience of Buddhahood. May it defeat our common enemy, wrongdoing. From the stormy waves of birth, old age, sickness, and death, from the ocean of samsara, may we free all beings. May we free all beings. May we free all beings. Thanks, everyone. Really appreciate uh, you being here today and spending some time with all of us.